chief editor of the series Intersections. Thanks to everyone at Brill Publishers, especially Ivor Romain. Thanks to Sandrine Dion and Antina Hartmann of Leiden University. And I would like to start with an item uh, that was in the international use only a few weeks ago. At a moment when the Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was arrested, entering Russia, he made a brilliant counter move. He released a documentary of two hours where he accused his rival, President Putin, of having built the most expensive palace of the world. In the video, we see, among others, a luxurious theater hall and a neoclassical swimming pool. Putin reacted swiftly on Navalny's accusations by stating that this was not his property, but, what, but by one of his friends. Moreover, it was not a palace, but a hotel. However, one of the images must have been very inconvenient for Putin. We see the president grim-faced. Behind him, he has a halo that shows striking similarities with a famous portrait of the French king Louis XIV when he presented himself in a ballet as the sun. The link with Louis XIV was not meant as a compliment, but pointed at the royal allures the president claimed. It defined Putin as extravagant and decadent. It compared his palace to Versailles. However, the comparison is far more problematic than the makers of the video realize. In the 17th century, the concept of magnificence was prominent in political and economic debates. The concept defined the big spending of kings and other rulers as a virtue. Whereas Putin was condemned for constructing the palace, Louis XIV was praised for having built Versailles. 17th century authors praised the French king for his magnum facere, literally making grandness. Building Versailles was Louis's duty as a monarch. In our book on magnificence, we have tried to come to better understanding of what modern man has no longer in common with people that lived in the 17th century. It is important to fully understand differences throughout time, such as the appreciation of spending enormous amounts of money for the construction of a palace. The editors and authors of this book hope that our book is a new step in the right direction of further historical understanding of big spending. So let me introduce Gijs Verstegen, one of the editors of this book. He will provide us with some insights of the book's origins. Gijs is, historians of, is, is a historian of the early modern Spanish court and works at the Universitat Rey Juan Carlos. Gijs, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stein, for your presentation. Uh, the idea to organize a conference and to edit a volume on magnificence started in 2017 in Leiden. Uh, I was there with a colleague of mine, Jose Eloy Ortal Muñoz, and uh, he suggested me to meet Stein Brussels. At the time, uh, Eloy and I were working on a project on the Spanish royal sites, um, and I focused my part of the research on the discourse on magnificence in Spanish courtly literature. And as we knew that Stein had been working on magnificence and the sublime, we thought it would be a good idea to get together and to uh, interchange some ideas. So on a gray afternoon in uh, July, we met in a cafe in Leiden. Uh, we had a couple of beers and a very pleasant uh, conversation. And we immediately connected um, because of our interest in the early modern reception of um, classical thought, staying from the uh, perspective of art theory. And I, because I was, uh, I focused uh, on that topic uh, in relation to courtly political and moral discourse. I remember we came up uh, with a lot of ideas and uh, ended uh, the afternoon uh, with uh, the plan to organize a conference in uh, Madrid on magnificence. Many plans uh, remain fake promises, but in August I um, already received several mails by uh, Stein, and uh, from that moment on we uh, worked closely together. 
Um, Stein proposed to elaborate on uh, the concept of magnificence, taking the uh, etymological origin of the word as a starting point, uh, magnum facere, uh, which refers to the fact that magnificence is first and foremost an action, a performance. Uh, magnificence as a virtue acquired its significance in practice. And from the beginning, uh, Stein got in touch with uh, uh, Walter Mellian, who enthusiastically uh, supported uh, our plans to publish a volume on magnificence in the Intersections uh, series, exploring the relation between ethics and aesthetics. Meanwhile, we received uh, institutional support from the uh, Leiden University, from the Universidad Rey Juan Carlos, but also from the uh, Instituto MOL, um, a Spanish research center on Flemish painting, and uh, from Lucas, the uh, Leiden University Center for uh, the Study of the Arts in Society, and uh, from two research projects headed by Felix Labrador, La Herencia de los uh, Sitios Reales, Madrid, the Corta Capital, and uh, Del Patrimonio Dinástico al Patrimonio Nacional, Los Sitios Reales. The conference took place uh, in March 2019 in Madrid, and I remember uh, these were one of the first beautiful uh, days in spring in Madrid, and the parks were full of people um, and enjoying the sun, and we spent um, on a very fruitful uh, discussion about the different ways of performing magnificence in Catholic and Protestant Europe. Thanks to Ana Jäges, um, who was also one of the organizers of the conference and participated in the conference, uh, but she also turned out to be an excellent uh, manager of public relations. We got a lot of media coverage and uh, news articles and a chronicle and an interview appeared in more than 20 newspapers uh, in Spain. But of course, the uh, importance was um, the debate on magnificence with researchers from many different fields, uh, literary history, history, art history, uh, philosophy, um, performance studies, the history of theater and dance, and uh, well, a lot of different points of view. But in spite of these uh, differences, we had a common ground. And in the discussion, each time we returned to um, Aristotle's definition of magnificence as the art of spending lavishly uh, in a way that is fitting to the agent according to the circumstances um, and focusing on the golden mean, trying to avoid the extremes of avarice and extravagance. And precisely this circumstantial uh, condition of magnificence, which explains its uh, adaptability to different cultural, religious, um, and historical contexts made this uh, debate so fascinating. To finish, um, in addition to Stein, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Guido Garzoni and to Nafsika Atanasuli for participating in uh, the book launch. And I also would like to thank, uh, on behalf of all the editors and the authors, the great work done by the copy editors Gera van Bedaf and Ivo Romein, uh, responsible for the, um, the final drafts of the text and the images. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, guys. I also remember that directly after we had a drink together, we ha I had dinner with Walter, so so we could directly make uh, make plans. <laughs> But so our next speaker is the third editor, Walter. Uh, Walter is Walter Mellian is a professor of art history at Emory University in Atlanta and has published widely on Dutch and Flemish art and art theory of the 16th and 17th centuries, on Jesuit image theory, and on the relation between theology and aesthetics. Very recently, he has become the president of the historians of Netherlandish art. So, so we'll meet again <laughs> on a different occasion. Walter, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. It was a great privilege to work on this project. And uh, I was the third editor as a representative of the Board of Intersections. And Intersections is a series published by Brill. The editor-in-chief is Carlin Enko that uh, embraces uh, multidisciplinary projects. And this was one of the things that so impressed me about Stein's and Geis's Magnificenza volume 
And uh, what I wanted to summarize is just a few of the things I took from working on the volume. I did not actually contribute an essay. I simply functioned as an editor, but um, I was fascinated to learn about the philosophical foundation of the notion of magnificence and benefited greatly. I'm just going to mention five of the articles. I thought the entire book was, was splendid, but I benefited greatly from uh, Matthias Reich's article in which he explains how and why um, magnificence was construed as a moral virtue. And uh, on the basis of a close reading of the Nicomachean ethics, and then distinguishes between understanding and erudition, magnificence and liberality, and the philosopher and the philologist, all as a way of showing how nuanced people's experience and articulation of magnificence was in the 16th, 17th, and I would say even the early 18th centuries. So there was a philosophical account of magnificence in the volume. And I was equally interested in the literary studies on magnificence, and especially um, what I take to be almost a kind of closing article to the volume in the sense, and here I'm thinking about uh, Plas Tindemann's marvelous article on John Wilmot's uh, Lucina's Rape, in which he shows how in the context of um, the later 17th century English court, magnificence is understood as dissimulation. It is no longer a licit form of simulation or licit form of staging one's moral virtue, but it is disenchanted and explains what the process of that disenchantment of magnificence is and why it can no longer function within a certain political context as a moral virtue. And so in a way, the book is bracketed by a clear definition, Aristotelian definition of magnificence as moral virtue, and an article that shows how it ceases to be able, how it loses that function, how it ceases to be able to function as a moral virtue. And then there was so much material um, that, that uh, just was illuminating to me and not least uh, Elizabeth Dane Hartog's article, whereas most of, of, of the articles were talking about, about magnificence as an instrument of, let's call it in Stephen Greenblatt's usage, self-fashioning, Hartog was talking about an instance of magnificence which is not about self-fashioning, but, but uh, about representing the magnificence of someone or an entity that is the United Province that had lost its political authority and its prestige as a function of the French invasion and the French capture of the city of Utrecht. And, and that article, which shows how gardens might be construed an expression of magnificence was really very, very fascinating to me. And then there was the very marvelous article by, by uh, Anne Madeleine Goulet that talked about competing notions of magnificence that enter into a kind of conversation with each other, French and papal, Italian princely magnificence, and magnificence of a member of an extremely old French aristocratic family. What happens when two representatives of two different systems or regimes of magnificence get married? How do they reconcile these two systems of magnificence? And what, 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 what are the different functions of the, the ceremonial magnificence they stage, both at Versailles and Rome? And then finally, uh, just to mention one more, but as I said, all of the articles I thought were, were splendid. It was a very consistent volume in that respect. I learned an enormous amount from uh, Miniati's article about the uh, royal exequies stage in Milan. And one of the things that fascinated me is you can see that there's a real distinction between exemplifying the magnificence of, this, of the city 
of Milan and representing royal magnificence through personification. So you don't personify the magnificence of Milan, but that you've staged a magnificent apparato that incorporates personifications of the magnificence of Elizabeth of France and then later for the exequies of Philip IV. Philip IV uh, declares their magnificence. So it's, it's exemplification is one mode of staging magnificence and personification is another mode of staging magnificence. And in these ceremonial exequies, both modes were working simultaneously. So one of the things I took from the volume is that magnificence has multiple modalities. And all of these modalities are contingent in interesting ways, but they all play upon each other. And finally, when I was a graduate student, we were still reading Fête de la Renaissance, Jaco's great volume, and thinking about courtly spectacle and its functions. And we were reading closely the work of Elizabeth McGrath and Francis Yates that in a very subtle way explained what the functions of ceremonial spectacle are. But what we needed, oh, and Patricia Wadi does this too in her book on, on princely palaces uh, in, in, in Rome, especially when she talks about the function of the ceremonial on, on Philad. And so there, there was this rich art historical and social historical discourse on spectacle and festivity. But what we needed was a book like Magnifici Magnificenza to explain to us how this critical category of magnificence operates and in operates in and through the apparatus of spectacle and the ceremonial of public festivity. So congratulations to Stein and congratulations to Hayes and congratulations to all of you, the contributors to this magnificent volume, which we're very proud to have in the intersection series. We were very happy to have you as uh, the third editor because you also did a great job by having that, that view from, from more outside to reflect on, on the contributions to make them even better than they were in, 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 in previous drafts. So thank you very much, uh, Walter. We invited uh, Nafsika Atanasulis to reflect on our book as she is a most respected expert uh, in the use of the concept megaloplepeia or magnificencia, magnificencia from Aristotle onwards. Especially her essay, A Defense of the Aristotelian Virtue of Magnificence, published in 2016 in the journal Value Inquiry, was very influential for our book. Nafsika, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for wanting to review our book. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, thank you all, the authors and the editors, for introducing me to this wonderful book. I thoroughly and genuinely enjoyed reading it. I would very much like to spend time on each of the individual contributions because I think they all deserve our individual attention. But given the time constraints, I thought I might talk about some themes that I saw in the book because I was quite uh, surprised and gratified to see that the book was very philosophical and there were some strong philosophical threads running through all the contributions to the volume, which I found very exciting. And I thought there's loads of ideas here for how things could progress in the future and for more work to be done on this topic. Uh, so I wanted to talk about those threads and maybe suggest in the end about more work that could be done so that if you have another conference, uh, it would be lovely to meet up and talk. So I'm, I am slightly jealous. I missed the Madrid conference and the sunshine of the spring, but hopefully things will get better around the world and there'll be another conference maybe next year. Okay, so for philosophers, magnificence is really an embarrassing virtue. We don't really talk a lot about it. When you tend to teach the Nicomachean ethics and you get to the long list of all the virtues, everybody concentrates on courage. Courage is a really easy one because intuitively everybody understands that you can have the emotion of fear and too much fear is going to be a vice, you're going to be a coward. Too little fear is also going to be a vice, you're going to be rash, but the appropriate mean is found 
encouraged just the right amount of fear for the situation. And this is the most discussed virtue because it's just easy for people to understand what Aristotle is talking about. Justice is a very interesting virtue because once you've introduced everybody to the mean, justice doesn't quite fit in. So there's quite a lot of good ideas there into how to adjust Aristotle's ideas of justice and how to make them compatible with the mean. Then by the time you get to magnanimity, you kind of say to everybody, well, look, this sounds really weird, but you have to understand the context within which Aristotle was talking. You have a society where honor was very important. So within that context, this is not a self-regarding virtue. You're not being particularly selfish or self-centered when you're saying that you are magnanimous. You're actually expressing one of the values of that particular society of having been honorable and acknowledging that you are honorable. And magnificence is completely ignored. If you are an Aristotelian, you're a bit embarrassed by magnificence because it's considered an Aristotelian mistake. I think, although this is just a supposition, this comes because of Bernard, Bertrand Russell, who in his history of philosophy kind of said that magnificence is a terrible mistake that Aristotle made. And this kind of followed on the decades after that, everybody has had this impression that along with slavery, along with misogyny, magnificence is the third of Aristotle's big mistakes. If you're an Aristotelian, you might forgive him his mistakes. And if you're somebody who objects to virtue ethics and Aristotle, you're going to smirk and point at magnificence to show how we all got it wrong and annoy us. My own work on magnificence is entirely coincidental. And I say this to show to you how little philosophers are interested in magnificence. About 20 years ago, in my PhD dissertation, I wrote two or three sentences about how there must be more to magnificence than this quick dismissal. And that was it. My external said, this sounds really good, you should write more on this. But it took 15 years for me to write the one paper that I have actually written on magnificence. And I think there's only, if you do a Google search in philosophy and magnificence, you're only going to get a couple of hits. But this collection shows why this is a huge, huge mistake. There is so much we can learn from this examination of magnificence in the 17th century, and so many perspectives that are revealed to us by these contributions. I think philosophers need to go back and pay the virtue of magnificence more attention. So one of the main reasons why magnificence is never mentioned in philosophical circles is the charge of elitism. If you're a moral philosopher and you're interested in presenting a convincing moral theory, you're trying to answer questions like, what kind of person should I be? How should I behave? How should I live my life? What is the right thing to do here? And those kinds of answers that you give ought to be open to everybody because morality captures our more important values and beliefs and our moral actions express our character and our most deeply held convictions. Now imagine if that was the case, and I said that most of you cannot be moral at all because you don't have an enormous amount of money. Now that seems really problematic. How could it be that the moral life requires large amounts of wealth? Surely Aristotle got it wrong. That is the main reason why magnificence is rejected as a fundamental part of the good life. But I think this is a misrepresentation of what magnificence is that becomes very clear when you read the contributions to this volume. A large number of authors in this volume show, with different case studies and from different perspectives, how magnificence is a virtue linked to those in a special position. So this could be monarchs or political leaders, dukes or religious leaders, but magnificence is always an expression of their status. That makes it a limited virtue, but this is not problematic because it's not a limited virtue which excludes, but it's a limited virtue which pulls in the people who happen to find themselves in this position. If you have a particular status of privilege, this generates in itself an obligation. And we have in the volume a lot of examples of this kind of link between status and magnificence. We have uh, contributions that highlight Kings, whose magnificence is an expression of their royal status as outranking everybody else, or possibly even their status as favored by God. 
we have expressions of magnificence as a need to express political power, a void that was created because military glory is no longer a possibility. So one of the new ways of expressing political power is magnificence. We have even depictions of the royal households, which functioned as a seat of political and diplomatic power through ceremonial and etiquette aspects of magnificence. We have contributions on how one ought to cultivate magnificence and how it's part of education as a special responsibility of those who are wealthy to bring up their children in a particular way to become magnificent. And even as the proper expression of wealth in times of religious and fiscal humility, even when it's inappropriate to have wealth and to spend wealth, magnificence is an exception because of the status of the person making the magnificent contribution and because of the goal of magnificence. So that gives us a huge number of examples of how magnificence can be expressed through various different conceptions of the special status of the person. We even have one contribution that shows what happens when you lose your status. Magnificence is so central to the expression of power that when the political and cultural power begins to fade, as it did for the Stuarts, the, the, the manifestation of this is an attack on magnificence. The two go hand in hand. Now, another reason why philosophers tend to dismiss magnificence is because they think it's very limited in its relevance. They tend to think that it only made sense within the social cultural situation of the ancient Greek polis and that it was limited in the expression of liturgies, a conception of practice that we no longer have. And since liturgies are obscure, magnificence makes no sense. But I think this is another very fundamental contribution of this collection. It shows us that magnificence can be expressed centuries after. Aristotle in a huge variety of ways. Even a lay person, someone completely outside the history of art like myself, can look at the church and imagine that this could be an expression of magnificence. The churches and halls, town halls, are perhaps more evident examples of magnificence. But we have in the book also detailed accounts of how ceremonies can be expressions of magnificence. Celebrations of births and baptisms, marriages, even commemorations of the deceased and their life. Of course, examples of art and paintings, but equally examples of mag magnificent plays, which include drama, dance, and music. And even, of course, the most wonderful of all, the magnificent garden of rare plants. I mean, as an outsider to this discussion, what a wonderful example. It just brought a smile to my face that there could be an expression of magnificence in gardening, in plants. And this is such a wonderful illustration of the fundamental Aristotelian idea that the flourishing life is not one thing for everybody. The flourishing life has to be an expression of that individual and their position in the life that they're leading at that moment. So the flourishing life is, in a sense, constructed by that individual's conception of the noble and the good in the society they find themselves in with the demands that it imposes on them. Sometimes at church, sometimes a celebration of the birth of a child, sometimes a garden of rare plants. So instead of being irrelevant, I think this volume showcases both the diverse conceptions of magnificence and its relevance in different social contexts. And it shines a light on how we should look at magnificence in contemporary terms. Instead of dismissing it as an outdated mistake made a long time ago, if we recognize that magnificence had this important and very diverse role in the 17th century, could we not maybe ask what could be the role of magnificence in the context in which we live in? We have a world that's facing climate catastrophe. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Couldn't there be different expressions of magnificence? If magnificence can be expressed in a garden of rare plants, could it not also be expressed in clean water for people who don't have access to clean water or to a vaccine to end 
a pandemic. Because all that unites all these different expressions of magnificence is that they're all targeted towards the noble and the good, whether this is interpreted as benefiting the common good of a community or divine worship or royal admiration or political authority. I think there's definitely a lot to be learned from reconsidering magnificence in all of its contexts, the Aristotelian, the 17th century, and even now. Thank you so much, Nafsika, for uh, not only giving a, a very nice uh, view, your own view on the book, but also on looking to the future and look at new steps to be taken with that, that Aristotelian concept of Michele Prepea and magnificence. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Guido Guerzoni, professor and researcher in economic history at Bocconi University. He has published widely on the history of cultural institutions and art markets and the history of culture. Our book has gratefully used his essay, Liberalitas Magnificentia Splenda, the classic origins of Italian Renaissance lifestyles. Guido, we really appreciate if you are willing to review our book today. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks. Um, the article you mentioned brought me back to uh, another period of my life because I began my research in 1994, so more than 25 years ago. And your invitation is an occasion to reflect about what happened in this almost three decades. At that time, magnificence was uh, a topic uh, of re mostly practiced by intellectual historians. Um, art historians met, uh, and uh, Walter mentioned Astrea, and, uh, and I remember Roy Strong. So there were a few art historians who were just investigating the dimension of magnificence, uh, not on a functional level. Uh, 30 years later, uh, the reason why I found extremely interesting and you know, foundational your book um, is represented by the next text that historical researchers could take, exploiting the ways you have indicated in your book. And I'm referring in my short speech about three different, uh, you know, promising point of, you know, development. The first uh, is the political awareness about magnificence. It was not only a moral virtue, but it was, the theoretical framework which motivated the assumption of decision taken on a daily basis. And referring to the article uh, focus on architecture and festivals or ephemera, um, apologies if I'm just going to write some example, but it's important to uh, want to remain in, in my time. What struck me is that there is a clear correlation between, uh, you know, uh, the beginning of some architectural cycles and a precise moment of political turmoil. So architectural magnificent patronage was not you know, random, was not given by an individual as well as celebrity choice, but is the result of a precise political calculation. And uh, the number of individuals involved again on a daily basis in this process is fairly astonishing. So we're talking some, some frequently about thousands of individuals uh, which were able to eat every day thanks to this project. Uh, even when we talk, when we deal about with, with ephemera, um, the Gonzaga court were able to spend 20% of their own yearly budget in, in one ephemera. So what we have to reconsider is the redistributive effect of, of magnificent expense. Because in certain Italian dukedoms, almost 50% of the old state budget was represented by expenses which could today refer as magnificent expenses. But they were, they were the engine which makes the you know, the economic wheel going and, and rotate, they were able to speed up 
the velocity of monetary circulation, for instance. So on one side, we have the theoretical justification of this expense. On the other hand, we have to study with the same attention what happened on a more practical level. So there is not only a matter of propaganda or you know, the political display, but politics is some you know, practical basic ground. And this ground were based on the money spent through this process. Um, otherwise, we can't understand you know, the resistance of this, of this spending models all the time. And uh, the sincere enthusiasm or collective consensus was not based only on the political suggestion, but was based on you know, the real benefit that many families in the city, in the capital, were taking from you know, being the protagonist on the lower level of the spectacles or on, on this yard. Um, I could mention one of the Italian historians that I most admire, um, which was Carlo Maria Cipolla. Carlo Maria Cipolla was not notoriously fond of hyperbole, but he gave a precise response when he was said that the examples of public works start in the 17th century, in order to counteract bouts of unemployment are so abundant that there is only the difficulty of choice. So 95% of new building, you know, building arts enterprise open by courts and republics in Italian 17th century, but I presume that the same discourse might hold true even for other regional contexts, is normally due to a reaction to uh, uh, the period of economic difficulty. So we can't detach the centrality of the magnificent debate with the role played by this kind of expense in order to try to solve unemployment, for instance. And the rulers of the time, they were perfectly aware about the political you know, meaning of the art. Um, so um, there is a famous treatise writer, Giovanni Battista Armenini, that describing this, you know, building phrasiness, uh, stated that it seemed that all Christianity is competing to make very beautiful temples, chapels, and monasteries, took into account this aspect to and this extremely concrete force of pity. So it was a way to redistribute, you know, wealth and, and, and to offer some time, you know, a survival or a survival strategy. The second point that uh, Nafsika told, and uh, I see to a dog, and uh, my dog is with me, so then we could share uh, part of the, our pets. This is an Italian hound, so I see a si Siamese cat. So we have historians, intellectuals, plus pets. And so uh, as, as part of this audience, we, we can't avoid to mention our you know, friends of sons or daughters, according to the different, you know, family ideas. Uh, when we were talking about magnificence, uh, we don't have to forget that uh, the debate about the discourse and the debate about liberality in certain country was even more important. So it's true, magnificent regards only few individuals with some status, but for instance in Italy probably is more interesting the debate about liberality and, which is the second point that I want to mention, social emulation. So magnificent through liberality impose certain, you know, uh, role models or spending models, uh, which became, you know, uh, the, the, the topic of an, another interesting debate, which is social emulatio. And uh, emulatio was considered extremely negative uh, in, in terms of, you know, the, it was able to disgregate uh, society because, and uh, here I could uh, quote a couple of marvelous example. Um, thanks to liberality, the artisans wants to be equal to the citizen, the citizen to the gentleman, the gentleman to the title, and this last to the prince. These are things too far beyond reason and measure and intolerable that displeased God and led to a thousand sins. When we look closely at the consumption models of early modern 
and you know, uh, 60 and 70th century European cities or cultures. Uh, we can't forget the role played by the dissemination of liberal model. And, um, um, you know, the, the impact that he has in terms of looking for novelties or introducing new products or introducing uh, imitations. I've been working for years about imitations. I mean, legal, they were not, you know, fakes. People were aware that they were going to buy things of different quality. But uh, in, 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 in the Italian society, and, as probably, and probably even in, in the Dutch one, the different layers of qualities of object is astonishing. So today we're not able to recognize that there were seven different types of, you know, black velvet. But in Genoa, they were producing six different types. And uh, an educated eye was able to distinguish the difference between black velvet. So today we are unable to, to make this subtle distinction, but uh, you know, fostering the, the debate about magnificent liberality, at the end, they induced the production of an enormous amount of goods as well as services that were at the base of the most innovative, you know, sectors of early modern production. So we can't uh, forget the, the relationship between, you know, century lows and magnificence, as well as, you know, the introduction of new goods and services and the spur determined by magnificence. So uh, again, if we don't look only at the theoretical aspect, but if we go through the, you know, again, the, the, the daily mechanism of, for instance, economic production, it's clear that uh, the, the, you know, the, the dual model magnificent and liberality were at the base of this, you know, this innovation process. So today we are obsessed with innovation, but the only way to keep the distance between the magnificent and the liberal was to innovate, introducing new materials, new patterns, new... And this is another positive result of the debate about magnificence. Um, and I want to conclude my remarks Mentioning uh, uh, funny examples, there is a marvelous letter that I found 20 years ago. Uh, it's a letter dated April 6, 1594. Well, the Grand Duke Ferdinando de' Medici was advising Zygmunt Bathory, uh, which was a Hungarian uh, counterpart, that his agent Cosimo Bottegari, which was traveling to Transylvania, was taking to him, and I'm quoting, some sables and lynxes, not those real ones that come from other parts, but those that art imitates in my Balwick. And these were sent not because of their value, but because of their novelty. So we know that in 1594, the Medici were producing sictating furs. Uh, so I don't want to launch a call to study uh, a global history of sictating furs that might have might be, you know, uh, a potential PhD topic. But again, if already in 1594, the Medici were studying how to produce synthetic furs, this is again a result of their obsession for magnificence. Because at that point, uh, it was not enough having introduced, for instance, <laughs> We have two dogs, a big one, and we have a Kanish, a toy. So even a Sika dog was looking for something was going on. So, but is the you know the human part of webinars? So human or animal part of webinars. And the nice thing is that the one dog from you Guido uh, is reacted by by Nafsika's dog so they are they are now communicating. marvelous there, there is a beautiful community of pets <laughs> communicating between Greece and Italy and uh, and anyway uh, this is the final remark so 
looking at Magnificent it does, is not limited to you know, a, a marvelous philosophical debate or the, intellect, the intellectual fundamentals of 17th century you know, ruling class mentality. It's, it's something more. Uh, it's the central point yes. from which a uh, new promising field of research could be opened. So this is the reason why I really appreciate mm -hmm. the book. Apologies for my for my pioppo, popular. No, thank you. Thank you very, very much for those reflections. Those two new aspects, actually, to 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 even more emphasize in, in future research. And I think that that what you already mentioned, the the liberalitas, uh, in in how far because that's also one of the first questions. In how far uh, is charitability? Uh, Charitable, uh, char charitability, the new magnificence, but, but actually there are also in, 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 in the Italian period and, and also in the 17th century, two different concepts. Or how, how would you uh, answer that question, uh, Guido, because I think that, that, that was reacting to your talk. Your sound is... Uh... Oh, Jeff, not understood. I, I was... I was covered by my dog. There is a question. So, in how far charitability, uh, the yeah. charitable, uh, comes into with magnificence, uh, and is it not also a new <coughs> of showing a modern or way more modern concept? I never found charitability more well. Uh, I limited my research to the end of sixteenth century. I found uh, the expression hero so hero took place of magnificent uh, but terribility in in my well in, in my long lasting research never appeared well i'm talking about the end of 16th century so mm -hmm. all right thank you uh nafsika the, the the next question is, is is for you addressed to you so when you saw that providing when you say that uh, providing clear water could become a contemporary form of showcasing magnificence, what would be the difference in the 17th century between uh, caritas and magnificence? Okay, I don't know, because I don't know about caritas. So I would love for you guys to tell me about the cultural context of caritas. But mm -hmm. I think the general idea is that if you're looking for situated contextual expressions of magnificence, then you could see it in Caritas in the 17th century, and you could see it today when we have people who don't have access to clean water and die because of it, but you could also see it back in Aristotle's times, when some theatrical aspects of the liturgies involved feeding the people. And what you saw was as important as what you ate. Mm -hmm. There was a charitable aspect, practically feeding people who didn't have enough food to eat while they watched the lovely play that you put on, and both were expressions of magnificence. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can give the floor to to, to Walter to 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 to, to more uh, elaborate on on that uh, relation between caritas and and magnificence. Since you're, of course, also a specialist in religious theory. Well, I I I think the point that Guido just made is an important point that that. Um, that expenditure is extremely important to the expression of magnificence because it's a way of, expenditure can also be magnificence and liberality because expenditure is a way of distributing resources. And of course, charitable giving is a way of distributing resources. And I was really fascinated by the case of the, uh, of the Prince of Bracciano who, who continues to spend an enormous amount on the apparatus of splendor, but he's doing it on credit. And precisely because he's doing it on credit, even though the apparatus looks just like the apparatus of any great prince, it doesn't seem to be efficacious anymore because there isn't actually expenditure going, there is no expenditure undergirding the apparatus there's an apparatus without the expenditure because he can't afford to spend. He can only borrow, but he cannot make good on his debts. And, and it, it goes to show, I mean, if expenditure is fundamental to the producing an effect of magnificence, which I think it was for the Prachani and for the, the cases that, that Guido 
brings up, then to the extent that charitable giving can be the result of massive expenditure, it can be symptomatic of, of magnificence. I mean, mm -hmm. that's one of the ways in which the charitable and, and uh, uh, mere display for the sake of display, they intersect and they intersect because of the importance of a system of expenditure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that Nela uh, makes it makes Nela de Raad uh, makes a nice addition. Uh, could we conceptualize the difference between charity and magnificence in that charity can imply pure giving, while magnificence always results in making something? The fakir, uh, um, maybe nafsika or uh, going back to Aristotle. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting distinction in itself. I, I, I'm. Guys, I'm limited here because I'm centuries before the issues you look at. But in Aristotle, there is no, as far as I know, expressed discussion of charity or benevolence or kindness. These are not identified as virtues or obligations in any way. We have to read these more modern concepts into Aristotle. Do you think there's a case to be made that the way Aristotle talks about magnificence there are a lot of links with how we understand charity or benevolence. Mm -hmm. so I do really like this point that charity becomes a wider concept of purely helping, purely giving, whereas magnificence is always, always tunneled through the idea of making something. That's very interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hayes, can you add on the discussion? Um, Yes, well, I can relate on it in relation to Nirenberg. Uh, he says charity is the basis of all the virtues uh, in a sense of uh, charity of love for all people uh, as an expression of love for God and also to magnificence. Um, but of course, um, especially uh, if you take into account certain uh, expenditures, if you take into account uh, the expenditures on uh, the foundation of schools uh, and new churches, um, especially uh, schools, uh, uh, Jesuit schools, uh, which also gave uh, uh, the possibility to um, for poor people to receive uh, education. In that sense, uh, magnificence comes very close to to charity. I think. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, the the difference is, isn't it that pointed out by by Aristotle that everyone can be charitable, but but not everyone can be magnificent. It's all about the amount of spending, uh, Nafsika. I have this slight worry with calling liberality charity. Because right. Charity as a term, I think, has other connotations that are added to it later on that aren't quite there in liberality. But I think it's an interesting question to ask. What are the connections between the two? And to what extent liberality is our modern concept of charity and magnificence is an extra obligation. Interesting. I don't know. You guys are leaving me with loads of thoughts and loads of exciting ideas for the future. Right. <laughs> That's actually a very good point to, to end this uh, book presentation. Uh, I would like to, to thank everyone, every one of you, uh, everyone here we were with 130 people so that's that's great but also everyone who spoke today all authors again thank you very very much i really enjoyed having the thoughts on the book again so i hope to see you all live once or really quickly but let's see about that thank you very much and see you at the back next book lounge that's amy galani's uh, book on the italian influence of rembrandt bye bye everyone bye thank you Thank you all. Bye-bye.